Hi, I'm Nick Nairn, and today I'll be cooking the main course. Now, this isn't fancy restaurant cuisine, but honest home cooking using readily accessible ingredients. Dishes with lashings of flavour that won't stretch the budget. You'll see me cooking meat, fish and vegetarian dishes, demonstrating basic techniques that get to the heart of what everyday cooking is really about. And the first dish I'm going to prepare is pot roast chicken paprika. This is very simple. It's one of these one-pot wonders. And the thing that I'm going to use for this is chicken thighs. Now, you can buy chicken thighs ready boned and ready skinned, which is what I've got here. And I've just diced them like so. Just say, there's a chicken thigh there. Just cut it down the center and then cut each piece into two. And I've got a pile of these here that I've done already. And we'll just pop those onto the boil because the first thing I want to do is season them with a little bit of salt and pepper before I fry them. And I want to brown the meat in a frying pan before I put it into the casserole to get a bit of flavour on the outside because that kind of caramelised coating of the meat is flavour. And it also helps to seal the flavour inside the meat during the cooking. So a little bit more salt in there. A little bit of freshly ground white pepper. And I have a penchant for using white pepper. Um, I get, um, I get well, some of my erstwhile colleagues digging me up about my, my uh, use of white pepper. But I find the flavour of white pepper is really nice and gentle for things like fish and white meat. So that's the meat seasoned, warm frying pan over here, and I'm going to add one tablespoon of sunflower oil. Don't use your best olive oil for frying meat because the high temperature tends to break down the lovely flavours in olive oil. Just swirl that about in the pan and then pop the pieces of chicken in. Now when you're doing this, you don't want to crowd the pan. You don't want to fill the pan so full of pieces of chicken that the temperature drops down and the, uh, the meat starts to poach rather than fry. Alternatively, you don't want it to catch fire. You don't want it to be so hot in the pan that the meat actually burns. Because chicken meat is quite delicate. That's about the right amount in there. Okay, so it takes about two or three minutes on either side. It should by this time be nicely brown. There we go. That's the kind of color you want on it. So just turn the pieces over, cook those for another two minutes or so, and then we're going to transfer them to casserole dish, the actual dish that we're going to cook them in. You want to work quite quickly here because when, once you take the meat out of the frying pan, the temperature of the frying pan starts to rise again because there's nothing in there to keep it cool. So working quite quickly, pick them out. And don't just tip the pan in there because you'll lose all that lovely oil that you've been frying the chicken in because that's starting to take on flavour now. So again, in with the second batch of chicken, even the distributed in the frying pan. Don't overcrowd them. There's nothing worse than if you try to fry meat and you put too much into the pan, the temperature goes down and you've got all that kind of runny stuff, that sort of white stuff coming out of the chicken, that's just the temperature's gone too low. And you end up poaching it rather than frying it. There we go. Okay, so just fry those again. Same thing, nice bit of colour on them and then we'll transfer them into the casserole. Now, the vegetables. Into the frying pan I'm going to add 25 grams of butter. I'll just allow that to melt. And as soon as I've turned the heat down a bit now, because I don't want the vegetables to burn. And as soon as that starts to froth and foam like that, I'm going to take one sliced onion. And cut this quite thick. Don't make it too fine. Slice onion in and that goes there. Just give it a little move about. Let it start to soften. Now, we don't want the, uh, the onion to brown. We just want it to go that lovely golden colour and soften. Next, I'm going to add in one diced red pepper. You can keep the skin on. The odd seed in there doesn't really matter. This is quite a rough dish. It's kind of like a peasant dish. You don't have to be too precise in your cutting. It's all going to cook down in the casserole and it all go quite soft and gooey together. So we just stir those around. And we're going to add in one clove of garlic, finely chopped. Give that a mix around. And one teaspoon, a generous teaspoon of paprika. Now make sure that you can try and find the, the freshest paprika you can get. A lot of people tend to buy a little jar of uh, ground spices. They keep it in the back of the cupboard for about um, a year and take it out and they expect to get some nice flavour out of it. You want to try and buy tiny amounts of uh, ground spices, the same thing for dried herbs, and use them as quickly as possible. They really only last for a couple of months. And you can see that lovely golden colour that the paprika adds to this. Now I just want to soften that two or three minutes, which is all it's going to take. And you just want to stir this from time to time to stop it burning. Now into this I'm going to add one 200 gram tin of chopped tomatoes. In that goes there. Just give that a quick stir around. And then to reinforce the tomato flavour, to give it a real nice tomato edge to it, I'm going to add one teaspoon 
of tomato puree. Pop that in there. And then, got a secret weapon, this. One teaspoon of red currant jelly. And that's just to balance the acidity of tomato. A little bit of sweetness in there. So just to stir that until the red currant jelly starts to melt. And you just want to cook this just for a couple of minutes, just to bring all the flavours together. And then I'm going to add one pint of chicken stock. And for this, I'm just using ordinary chicken stock cubed in water. There's lots of strong flavours in there. There's garlic, there's paprika, there's onions and tomatoes. You don't need to go to the time and expense of making homemade chicken stock for this. Keep that for your really fine sauces. Right, so in goes the stock. One pint of chicken stock. And then I just want to bring this back to the boil. And then we'll transfer it into the casserole. Mmm. There we go. Just give that a quick stir around just to make sure they're evenly distributed. And then we're just going to add to that one teaspoon of fresh thyme leaves in there. And if you're using dried, about half a teaspoon because they're much stronger in flavour. Give that a stir around. Now this is important. You must just take a little taste before you put it away to the uh, oven just to check the seasoning. Mm. Just a tiny little bit more salt in it. Oh, that's really good. A little more salt. And then finally, the potatoes. 350 grams of diced potatoes, peeled diced potatoes, and I'm using Maris Pipers. They're a good kind of all-purpose potato. Stir those through, and they're going to cook and just slightly cook down a bit and help to thicken this, because there's no flour in here. The potatoes actually are the thickening agent for this. So you want them quite finely diced. Okay, so we'll just pop the lid on there, and I'm going to cook that in a medium oven gas mark four for about 35 minutes. One way to boost the flavour of stews and casseroles is to add a little bit of flavoured butter at the end of that. And for this one, I'm going to use shallot and tarragon butter. And here's how you do it. It's just 25 grams of melted butter and 100 grams of finely chopped shallot. And I've just sweated these very gently for about five minutes until they're soft but not coloured. Once the shallot mixture has cooled, add it to 125 grams of softened butter and then add 25 grams of finely chopped fresh tarragon. A teaspoon of lemon juice, a little salt and freshly ground white pepper. Mix it all together. Make sure the tarragon is evenly distributed through the softened butter. Then spoon the softened butter, tarragon and shallot mixture onto a sheet of cling film and then just smooth it out a wee bit. Take the edge of the cling and just roll it around. Try and get any air pockets out. Just take your time doing this. Roll it up to form a sausage, like so. Then just twist the sausage to seal one end, tie it off, then turn it upside down just squeeze the mix to make a perfect circle and repeat the same thing. And then pop it into the freezer until it's ready for use. And this is the butter, so I'm just going to unwrap it straight from the freezer. And then you want to cut a couple of tablespoon sized pieces. And we're just going to stir those into the hot roast chicken paprika. Now, here's the paprika straight from the oven. And we'll just lift off the lid there and it's just simmering away. And then I need a spoon and just add the bits of butter. Actually, it helps if you cut them into smaller pieces so they melt quicker. And then we'll just add them in there, just dot them over the top. Now, it's quite important that as the butter melts, you just stir it in so it just amalgamates into the lovely, rich sauce, the lovely, rich gravy. Now, I've used uh, shallot and tarragon butter in here, but you can use all different flavours in there. Chilli is particularly good. Uh, lemon and garlic, parsley, um, pesto, sun-dried tomatoes, just about any kind of strong flavoured thing works particularly well. And for serving, just spoon it into some warm serving bowls, perhaps a little bit of creme fraiche on top of that, a little sprinkling of chopped chives, and this is gorgeous with some plain boiled rice and some butter noodles. Now for my next main course, I'm going to make a baked fillet of trout served in a bed of glazed leeks with a lemon butter sauce. And we're going to start with butter sauce. Now, a classic butter sauce, a beurre blanc, is made by reducing down white wine vinegar, white wine, peppercorns, shallots, and then laboriously whisking in a cube at a time cold butter. It takes ages and it's quite difficult, it's liable to split. I've got a much easier version here. This is my nage butter sauce, and it's just made by reducing down some uh, marinated vegetable stock or nage, and then using one of these, an electric hand blender, to whisk in the butter the whole lot at one time. 
Now, to make naj, it's very simple. You just dice up lots of different vegetables, bung them in a pan, cover them with cold water, add a bit of flavouring, maybe a bit of uh, star anise, some coriander, some peppercorns, a bit of garlic in there. Bring it to the boil, simmer it for eight minutes, then a handful of fresh herbs, stocks and all, any combination you like. Another two minutes simmering, and then half a bottle of uh, white wine in there. Leave the whole thing to cool, pop it into the fridge, leave it for two days, and during that time, all the vegetables mellow, and you get this lovely, sweet nage of vegetable stock. Just strain it off into a clean bowl, and what I've done here, I've measured out 600 millilitres of that very vegetable stock, and I'm just going to reduce this down by fast boiling by about four fifths. And what happens, as you can see here, it gets really nice and dark and sticky in there. Loads of flavour. The flavour is really concentrated into here. Now, we're going to just whisk in the, uh, the cold butter here. I've got 200 grams of diced cold butter. It must be cold straight out of the fridge. And I'm just going to make sure there's a bit of heat underneath here because what happens if the heat drops down too low with the cold butter going in there, that's when it splits out. So we'll just turn the heat up to just a low, gentle heat. There we go. Just bring that just till it's coming to the boil. And I'm just going to spoon it in, all in a one in it goes, into the hot vegetable stock. And they work quite quickly now. Take the electric hand blender and just tip the pan to one side. Stick the blender in, and away you go. Make sure you've got a nice deep pan, because it does tend to spray about a bit. And you want to just keep working this until it's nice and light and frothy. Okay, so you can see it's got really nice and light and frothy in there. And that's the basic butter sauce. Now, it needs to be flavoured. And you can use any kind of flavourings you like. Fresh herbs are particularly good in here. Diced tomato or sun-dried tomato, perhaps a bit of pesto or tapenade or something like that. But for this, we're going to use lemon. And the real flavour from lemon comes from the zest of lemon. Now, I've got the zest of a whole lemon in here. And I'm just going to spoon that in. Give that a little swirl around just to get the flavour from the zest, the, kind of the oily part of that. That's that real character of the uh, citrus fruit comes from. And then just to balance the sweetness of that, because those carrots in there have made that uh, nage quite sweet, I'm going to add one teaspoon of lemon juice. In it goes there. A little bit of seasoning, a little bit of salt, and freshly ground white pepper. A little bit of salt and there's the pepper. A quick swirl around. Now, it's really quite important that you taste it at this stage, just to check that seasoning. So we've got a spoon in here. Just take a little bit up there. Mm. It's such a good sauce, and it really it goes with all fish perfectly. And it's particularly good with Scottish trout, and that's what we've got here. So to cook the trout, we're going to get um, a little gratin dish here, which have heavily buttered, loads of butter in there, okay? And uh, we're taking these, these fillets of trout, season them up again with a little bit of salt and pepper. Be quite generous with the seasoning. We take a fair bit of salt and pepper, a little squeeze of lemon juice over the top, like so, and then just roll them up like that, there. And then take them and just pop that in the, the gratin dish. Make sure they're not touching. Make sure that they, if they touch, then they tend not to cook at the parts that they're actually touching. Now, to finish that off, we need to do is just take a little bit of butter and dot the top of each one with a little cube of butter, like so. The butter just melts during the baking and self bases it, keep them nice and moist. And then last thing, a couple of tablespoons of water in here, and that just stops the bottoms from burning and sticking to the gratin dish. And that's it. We're going to bang these into a hot oven, gas mark eight, for just six or seven minutes. That's all it takes to cook them. You don't want to overcook the fish. And there it is, that's the baked filter trout. I'm serving that with some glazed leeks. They're very simple to make, glazed leeks. Just cut up big chunks of leeks into a frying pan with lots of butter, a bit of lemon juice, salt and pepper, and cook them very slowly for about 40 minutes until they're nicely coloured on either side. Turn them halfway through. Now, the last thing we have to do is to take the cooking juices from the gratin dish and just pour them back into the butter sauce. Now, this is going to look all kind of splitty and bits of globs of butter floating about. But remember, help is at hand in the shape of the electric hand whisk. In it goes again. Just give it a last minute froth up. Make it nice and frothy like that. Just a little bit round the edge of the plate, like so. And perhaps just a little touch over the top of the trout. Perhaps a little bit of herb, just a little bit of shovel or uh, parsley on the top there. And that's it. That's my baked fillet of trout, glazed leeks, and a lemon butter sauce. 
Now another idea for our main course is to make a lovely savoury tart. You can use an endless variety of fillings, but I particularly like smoked haddock with pea lentils because that lovely earthy flavour of the lentils combines beautifully with the smoky haddock. Start by making pastry for the case. Rub together 175 grams of butter, 225 grams of plain flour and a teaspoon of salt. Continue until the mixture looks nice and crumbly. Add one medium egg and bring it all together into a dough. Knead this lightly three or four times with floured hands. Cover with cling film and chill in the refrigerator for at least an hour before use. It actually freezes well at this stage. Defrost it overnight in the fridge. Then line a greased metal flan tin, line with grease with paper and fill with baking beans and then bake in a hot oven for 11 minutes. Then remove the paper and beans and that's called blind baking. Bake for another 8 or 9 minutes until golden brown. Then make the haddock and pea lentil filling. Cook 50 grams of pea lentils in lightly salted boiling water for 20 to 25 minutes until they're tender. Drain and leave them to cool. Cook some smoked haddock in boiling double cream. Cover and put for three minutes over a very low heat. Remove from the heat and tip the pan's contents into a large sieve set over a mixing bowl. Then break up the fish with a fork and leave it to cool. Then mix three beaten eggs into the fishy cream and add the cool lentils. Some grated fresh parmesan cheese, some chopped fresh coriander and the flaked fish. Check the seasoning but go easy on the salt as the smoked haddock will be salty already. Dump the whole lot into a pastry case and bake for 25 minutes at 190 degrees centigrade or gas mark 3 until the tart is just set. Cut into wedges and serve warm. Smoked haddock and pea lentil tart. The same principles apply to any savoury tart. Now my next dish involves couscous and couscous is very simply cracked grains of semolina that have been coated in flour to stop them sticking together and it's very easy to work with because most couscous you buy these days is pre-cooked. All you have to do is pour on boiling stock or water and the grains just swell up and absorb the stock. Now I'm going to give it a kind of North African flavour profile for this dish but it's a great thing for carrying all kinds of flavour because on its own it's a little bit bland. The couscous is flavoured with cumin, cinnamon, coriander and allspice. I add pine kernels, raisins, a touch of sugar and the hot vegetable stock. Cover the couscous pan and leave it off the heat for five minutes. Then fork it up until it's light and crumbly. I add a true touch of Morocco, a few slices of preserved lemon, finely chopped. You can find them in many delicatessens but they are optional. It won't spoil the dish if you leave them out. Then the couscous is topped with a tower of roast vegetables which have been cooked in a very hot ribbed grill pan. Aubergine, onion, peppers and courgettes and lots of olive oil and seasoning. And the final touch is a sauce made from shallots cooked gently with the same spices, some chopped tomatoes, fresh coriander and lemon juice. That's North African couscous with the roast vegetables. Now the next main course I'm going to make is a peppered fillet of beef and of course an important ingredient is, is the pepper. And I'm using a coffee mill to grind it down. Just nearly there, that's it there. Now what you end up with in a, if you use this is you end up with a mixture of fine pepper and coarse pepper. So what I'm going to do is just tip this into a sieve set over a bowl and then just use the sieve to get the fine pepper out because it makes the steak too hot. So we'll just knock that out there and then we're going to tip the coarse pepper which is what you want, so you get that lovely crunchy pepper crust on the pepper steak. And of course, this time I'm using black pepper because black pepper and beef just go together so well. And talking to beef, here it is here. Now I'm using a fillet steak, but you could easily use sirloin or ribeye. Now, to help the pepper stick to the steak, take a little bit of Dijon mustard, a smooth grain Dijon mustard, and just smear it on the outside of the steak. And actually the best way of doing this is just to use your fingers. Okay, get it ni nice and even, so that means that you get a good coating of pepper on the outside. You don't want too much, just about that much there. Okay, that's it ready now to dip into the pepper. So just pop it in there, press it down, turn it over, same thing, just give a little shake, press it down, and of course remember to get the edges as well. And then you want to just take any excess off, you don't want a really heavy crust of pepper, otherwise you'll just never be able to eat it, it'll be far too hot. That is the kind of coating that you're looking for. Okay, we'll just turn this heat up to full volume. You can see it's almost smoking there, really, really hot. And I'm going to take one tablespoon of clarified butter. 
Now, I'm using clarified butter with no buttermilk in it because it can withstand this very intense heat. And I'm just going to pop the steak in there. I resist the temptation to play about here and move the steak about. Leave it for at least two minutes to get a really nice seared crust on the bottom side of it. So about two minutes there, and then we'll turn the steak. Okay, now that should be just about ready for turning. Now be very careful when you're turning, because you don't want to disturb the crust, okay? So just slide the tongs under there, turn it over, and you can see that lovely, crispy, seared crust on the outside. Also, that very high temperature helps to break down the heat of the pepper. and makes the pepper just that little bit milder. Now at this stage, after I've turned it, I'm just going to add one teaspoon of ordinary butter here. And what's going to happen here is the butter melts and it froths and it foams. And you can see it just spreads around the edges and that helps to seal the edges. And it also makes a really nice base for this rich pepper sauce. That goes around there. That's it. Now this is for a rare to a medium to rare steak. If you want to cook it well done, give it about another two to three minutes on either side. Okay, so that's it. Had a couple of minutes on either side. It's got a really nice crisp pepper crust on the outside. I want it very quickly now. I'm going to add a little bit of salt seasoning on here. Now, the reason for putting the salt on now, if you put the salt on earlier, it pulls all the moisture out of the steak and the pepper won't stick. Now, very hot pan, brandy, very generous amount of there. Little, uh, whoa, whoa! Not necessary for having as many flames, but I love it. Okay, I'm just burning all the alcohol off. And now I've added two tablespoons of beef stock. And the intensity of the pan, I'll just turn that down a little bit, almost reduces it instantly. You can see it reduces that really quickly in there. Just swirl that around. And then to finish off the sauce, a couple of tablespoons of double cream. In it goes there. Just give that a little swirl around. And reduce it down so it's really nice and thick. A little bit of salt in there, and then to give it that little extra bit of richness, another teaspoon of butter, in that goes, and just swirl the pan as the butter melts, and that just makes a really nice, glossy, rich sauce. I love to serve this peppered fillet with those pale, pinky orange sweet potatoes for a welcome twist. And you don't need anything else except perhaps a simple salad of mixed fresh herbs. It's my favourite garnish at the moment. Now, I know most people are a bit nervous about making soufflés, and they do have a dreadful reputation for causing some unmitigated culinary disasters. But actually, they're quite simple. You just have to follow a few simple rules. And the process is very similar for all different kinds of soufflés, even sweet soufflés. So here we go. The first thing you have to do is heavily butter the dish. And I really mean slap it in there. Don't worry, the butter will melt during cooking and disappear. Make sure that the top part here around the rim is especially heavy buttered because this is where the souffle is going to rise out and if it's going to catch, this is where it's going to catch. Okay, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to take some fresh white breadcrumbs and mix those with an equal quantity of fresh grated parmesan. And fresh parmesan, none of that little dried, sick tub things that you find in the, the back of your cupboard somewhere. Just mix that together, equal quantities, pop it into the souffle dish and then just turn the dish around to make sure that the breadcrumb and parmesan mix just sticks evenly all the way around the side. And what this does is it forms a little crust, a little shell that allows the souffle to rise out of the dish without sticking to the side of the dish. And that's it there. Now you can make this up the day before even and stick it into the fridge until you're ready to actually make the souffle. Now, to make the base for the souffle, you're just going to make a bechamel. And to do that, first of all, you need to make a roux. And that's 25 grams of melted butter, 25 grams of flour, Pop that in there and just whisk them together until the butter's absorbed all of the flour, like so. And just cook that for just a couple of seconds, whisking away to stop any lumps forming. Once it's nice and smooth, start adding 275 millilitres of hot milk, and it must be hot milk, otherwise, you're going to get big lumps forming in here. So, a little bit of time, whisk it in, a little bit more, keep whisking. And because it's hot milk, it's going to come to the boil very quickly and the bechamel will thicken up very quickly. This takes about two or three minutes and once it's nice and thick, you just want to leave that to cook away in a very low heat, stirring from time to time. That'll take about ten minutes in total. And here's the bechamel. It's cooled down now and I've turned it out into a bowl and I'm go going to go on and make it into the souffle base. And to do that, I'm going to enrich it with four egg yolks. I'm just going to pop those in there. 
and a little bit of extra flavouring. I'm going to put a little teaspoon of chopped thyme leaves in here. And there you go. A little bit of seasoning, a little bit of salt. Look quite easy on the salt here because the uh, goat's cheese is quite salty. Good uh, twist of freshly ground white pepper in there. And then I'm just going to fold those together just until the yolks are incorporated into that bechamel. And then we're going to add the flavouring. Of course, this is a goat's cheese souffle, so the flavouring is goat's cheese. And goat's cheese is particularly good for souffles because it's got a lovely, strong, pungent flavour. And I've got 225 grams of goat's cheese in here. And in that goes in with the bechamel and the egg yolks and the thyme and a little bit of seasoning. And I'm just going to whisk this together just till it comes together. You don't want it too smooth. It's nice to have a little bit of uh, cheese still through it so that when you eat into the souffle, you get these little lovely bits of cheesiness in it. So where we go, whisk those in together. There we go. Can you see that just starting to come cleanly away from the sides of the bowl? And that's the souffle base. Now, you can make this up in advance, but if you want to store this, just dot the top with a little bit of butter. The butter melts and it stops a skin forming on it. Or you can just put a sheet of cling film on top, press it down, and then pull the cling film off when you come to use it. One thing you must make sure is you allow this to come back up to room temperature before you do the next stage, which is to add the meringue. Now, the meringue is the engine that makes the souffle rise, and it's just simply egg whites that have been whisked up. A couple of things you can do just to help this to rise. Add a little bit of salt into the egg whites before you start whisking them, and just a tiny, tiny couple of drops of lemon juice. And that just helps to soften the almond and allows it to be stretched. So, whisker ready, electric hand whisk. You can do this by hand, but it is very tedious. Much better to have one of these electric hand whisk, and away we go. Now, if you're making a sweet meringue, the sugar in here, the sugar stabilizes the meringue. Without any sugar in here, for a savory souffle, you've got to be very careful that you do not over whisk this. Because once you over whisk them, all the strands of the albumin, which are being stretched by the whisking process, snap and they stop storing any air in here. Stops the souffle from rising. Once you start to see the trace, can you just see that the trace of the beaters in there? That's when you want to slow down and just take things nice and easy. Keep moving it about, and there, oh, stop. So just take that out, and you can just see the soft peak there just curling over. Just shake that off. Now, you want to work quite quickly here because the air starts to go to the meringue, especially one without any sugar in it once it's whisked up. Take one quarter of the meringue mix and add it to the souffle base. And then just fold that in, and that just breaks up the base and it makes it much easier to fold the rest of the meringue in. Because this is the stage where you want to try and keep as much air in the souffle as possible. Because this, the, the air is the thing that's trapped in there. When you put it into the oven, the air gets hot, it expands, and it forces the souffle up. And that's the thing that makes the souffle rise. OK, so that's just, it doesn't matter if you can still see a wee trace of egg whites. Add all of the rest of the whites into there. And you want to handle these quite carefully because they're full of air and you don't want to knock the air out of it. And then using a kind of cutting motion, just fold the whites in like that. Now this can be just a little bit time consuming, but just take the trouble to do this because the last thing you want to do is to go to all the time and trouble of doing this, pop it into the oven and hey presto, nothing. There we go. So that's it. That's the souffle base. That's it there. You can just see that texture. Just see that texture there? It's just kind of falling back, the weight just pushing it back again. Now, take the souffle dish that we buttered and cover with breadcrumbs, and then very gently pour the souffle mix into the center. Like that. Try not to work it too much, because you're not the air out of it. And it should come up to just about half an inch below the rim, like that. OK, so that's it in there. And we're just going to bang this into a, a hot oven, gas bar at 7, for about 35 minutes. And there it is, fresh from the oven. And that's how it should be well risen and golden brown. Now, it doesn't matter if it's a little bit cracked in the top like that. It's all part of the character of the souffle. Well, I hope you've enjoyed watching me demonstrate some of my favourite main courses. Now it's time for you to try them yourself. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.